I nearly lost my family on account of that. <laughs> they all said that, you know, I was writing about that monster Lars. <laughs> But is, is that Basically. a reprint of your little... Thing? This is a reprint. Of, yes. <laughs> I remember that, yes, very vividly. Well, that was the first defense of him, and by a woman, which is strange, because since then some of the women feminists have turned against Lawrence. Erroneously, I think. Very erroneously, I yeah. should say, yes. <laughs> uh, Shall I set up the scene now and put up our markers? Oh, actually, <laughs> we don't need mic. Are you on? One second. Uh, one second, I think. Uh, one second. Uh, he's mic'd uh, uh, his camera. Thank God we've got no camera. Uh, you know. Yes. Okay. Are you all right? Clack. Bang. Um, I was lucky to have five or six minutes alone with Anais Neen just to set up the picture for today. And she was intrigued to find it was Lawrence, and I told her we've been conducting a sort of paper chase across the literature of the last 50 years, trying to trace what the Germans would call the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, uh, through the big books of the age. And now we come flop onto the middle of D.H. Lawrence, Sons and Lovers, which in our last discussion we agreed was probably his most important book because he not only uh, conquered artistically his mother fixation, which is one of the grave problems of his life, uh, but also he became an artist by killing Lawrence's mother fixation. He surmounted it in, in a work of art which ends with a note of affirmation which he refuses to follow his mother to the grave. And I was very lucky in this because Anais had just finished the new revamp of his life by Harry T. Moore, who's a friend of hers, uh, and who wrote an excellent biography of him and was also a skillful editor of his letters. And while we were talking about this, we mentioned the period in Paris where Henry Miller was wrestling with a huge book and where she came out with one of the first women's monographs on the subject. But she was delighted that we'd picked a Freudian view. I hadn't yet got to the point of deciding whether Lawrence really knew Freud very well. I think not. But Frida confesses to knowing. Did, yes. you, did you ever meet Frida? No, I, I met her once, but we didn't talk about that. But there is a great deal in the book. Uh, I think it was part of Lawrence's desire to create himself that he didn't like to admit sources and origins, and that he actually kept uh, warring against the Freudian concepts while he was at the same time exemplifying them exemplifying. And, and, and carrying them out, but he wanted to feel as an artist that he didn't have, didn't have a source from psychoanalysis. He mm. hated that. And yet he absolutely fulfilled uh, uh, Freud's prophecy that Western civilization was going to annihilate um, sensuality by its over intellectualization. So he was carrying out, he was really doing what Freud had threatened might happen to us. That and trying to counteract down. it artistically. Yes, mm. Mm. So he, he was Freudian without perhaps knowing it or I'm wanting delighted. to know it. Do you think the mother fixation, another point we came up with yesterday was I considered that the mother fixation with its uh, with its bent towards homosexuality and narcissism is not only a great artistic problem, but it's become increasingly a popular problem, a problem of everybody. Yeah. But I did also feel that long before Freud gave us the notion of transference, that mummy had, uh, had a way of resolving this crisis with her, with her sons uh, in, a, in a natural way, and that with a bit of intuition, one can dissolve a transference without a laborious analysis or without letting it turn sour. But I don't know any mothers who, of writers who have done that. Well, it's precisely the writers yeah. who suffer the most they and are the most <laughs> feeble. From a woman writer's point of view, is it a problem? The narcissism is inevitable, isn't yes. it? Yes, it's the same problem and it's reversed. I think it takes place between the father and the daughter instead of mother and son. The woman also has to cut off the umbilical cord, but the umbilical cord is towards the father. But as it was in do, you, do you feel that mothers are not doing their job today? I think mothers are throwing their children out of the nest more often now than they used to mm -hmm. because they are professional women who usually don't tend to stay, you know, to hang on to the children. Mm -hmm. I think there's more of a chance of that not happening. But there's also another thing is that we're beginning to understand the, um, 
the double nature of Lawrence, the feminine and masculine, what you said the other day, mm -hmm. that which Lawrence was concerned about. He was concerned whether he had tendency towards men or tendency towards women, but I don't think that now the artist is concerned about that anymore, that he thinks of himself as androgynous and is not worried about it. Did you have, when, when you started on Lawrence, did you have these ideas in mind already or have they slowly formed since? In my case, I didn't. Uh, I, did, I just loved I him. did understand the androgynous quality mm, because I, I kept saying he stays to two sides of the case all the time. When he describes lovemaking, he describes how the woman feels, which was very unusual for mm. a male novelist. And, and then he describes how the man, and he keeps a duel between the two sides of his own nature. Yes. So that he's very, very much, uh, he seems to be speaking for woman as much as for man. That's why I never understood, you know, the attack against him. Because he does state the two. I think so. Well, the big ones and always I do. Proust. feel that. Proust, too. Yes, Proust, Proust, Proust women are marvelous. Proust and so are Shakespeare's yes. girls. But there we have uh, more mm. knowledge of his feminine side. I mean, yes. we, we know more about mm. the feminine side. Mm. Well, the feminine side of Proust, of, uh, of, of Lars, because of the Puritanism and, I guess, the English uh, culture, he fought against An it. An enormous conflict, yes. yes. He, mm. he couldn't have. Mm. Tell us a little about what you were just telling me about the new Harry Moore description. He's added a great deal to the book. He's added um, a great deal about the friendships, and he has confirmed my feeling that he was the only novelist who really described ambivalence, contradictions, and paradoxes constantly, which mm -hmm. he was composed mm -hmm. of. I mm -hmm. mean, he himself was a paradoxical and contradictory character. And he was able then to pass on to us the knowledge that we are ambivalent and we have oscillations and we mm. have love and hatred and we have contradictory feelings and we have conflicts. And he described those better because he, he had them and admitted them. Mm. He didn't mm. try to make a neat little package and say no. everything is solved, marriage is solved, love mm. is solved, mm. everything has a solution mm. and all that. And he went into the, uh, very deeply into the, uh, the contradictory nature of our, of our character. Mm -hmm. mm. And all professing not to know anything about Freud. Oh, yes. He, he was running yes. parallel to Freud, <laughs> yes. and he was an artist resolving these problems in terms of characters. <laughs> yes, I think that's true. Do you find anything to disagree with in what we're just saying? Can you understand why a woman's lib feels that Lawrence is unfair to girls? <laughs> oh, only because he talked. Excuse me, were you going to say well, something? There, uh, I've seen some of the things which are cited in women's lib literature about yeah. Lawrence. Nonsense. Um, the dominant, uh, <laughs> semi bestial um, lower class man dominating the upper oh. class woman. <laughs> That, that's Chatterley. That's very, very showing. Yes. That's Chatterley. But no. that's a misinterpretation, mm. I think. A caricature of Lawrence. They have made a caricature of Lawrence. Also, his concern with leadership. And uh, I never took seriously these things about who is going to be the leader in the marriage because actually <coughs> uh, the relationship with Frida was tremendously, wonderfully balanced. And, they, and she had great sense of humor, and she could go to battle and not, not collapse. Mm. And so she said when she was fighting in court for the inheritance, you remember the, mm -hmm. the sister wanted to take it away from her, and they started to sentimentalize the relationship. She said, that's not true at all. Well, we quarreled all the time. But, but they quarreled on a, what shall I say, honorable, honorable <laughs> combat. Yes. And so uh, I don't think there was this affirmation of I am the leader of the family, I am the head of the family, which he said, but I didn't ever believe. But he did call her the queen bee. Called her the queen bee. Well, oh. she certainly... Well, uh, that's uh, good. That's good <laughs> psychology, too. It did, really did work in comparison with the Miriam relationship. And I like very much that, that phrase. It's not his, and I don't know where it comes from, which says that uh, in a, a good marriage or a good love affair, um, both command uh, and both obey, yes. because uh, be the, the dimensions are really complementary and not warring, exactly. uh, which I, I, I strongly believe in. You should have been here yesterday um, for the seminar, which was given um, with Dr. Quinone, um, 
he was talking about uh, paradoxes of time, transition in literary concept of time, particularly from Renaissance uh, into post-Renaissance culture, and then about the end of the 20th century, the transition into modernism, which he claims has already passed. And uh, he talked extensively about Lawrence um, as being someone who was right on top of that transition. And, uh, he talked particularly about um, one of the novels, I forget which one. Rainbow. Rainbow, yeah. Uh, where the mother is part of the old bourgeois culture in America. Mm -hmm. The value is con continuous continuation of the family. Uh, so she, her proper function, which she is aware of, is to be a mother, to be a bearer of children. Whereas her daughter is into the um, more modern conception of time, which is coming in, not conception of. Or to state, uh, sort of a breakdown of time, a feeling of the clock is intruding into a person's subjective time, much like um, Ferguson. Well, in the visual age, time is, uh, what, is it how many feet a second? Is it 28 frames a second? 24. Reality is there now 24 frames a second. It ought to be taken into account a bit. There's only Cocteau, I seem to remember, who did take that into account. And in one lecture, which I heard, I asked a wonderful question. He said, what's the difference between a photograph of Notre Dame on a picture postcard and a cine camera film of it? And he said, the difference is that the camera is photographing time passing. <laughs> but when you first came to Lawrence, did you have a very uh, strong views about feminism, about freedom oh, yeah. of the artist or something? It's really just simply you loved the man for what he was doing. Yes, I had an intuition. Uh, intuitive understanding of his work, I think, but I, I was not by any way conscious of any feminism. I was defending him mm. From, mm. Uh, from very careless remarks made about that. And I felt that he had understood and described, uh, I quoted recently in an article on erotica in women, uh, one of the most beautiful descriptions of a woman's reaction to lovemaking was done by D.H. Lawrence. Was, uh, what did Henry see in him? Why did Henry suddenly go around the bend about him? <laughs> you see, I wasn't there at the time, so I don't know. I don't know. He thought um, one thing. Of course, there was a masculine-feminine thing. He thought I had uh, underdeveloped. My book was not developed enough, and that more could be said. And so he started out what he called a big book on Lars. And, uh, you know, mine was very condensed and it was a woman's point of view. And then it began to effloresce and, and expand and expand and expand and expand and expand. The more, you know, he went into it, the more he found We've it's got a map of that. And he, uh, then he couldn't uh, make a synthesis. Well, you can't make a synthesis of Lawrence. That was really, I think, the point we didn't get either way. Yes, no, because he was in motion the whole time, yes, like a jet of... Yes, uh, because he was uh, happening. He was, uh, and so was Henry. <laughs> I, I'm just thinking of that gigantic blackboard, which I think the students will be <laughs> amused to see. This is what happens when Henry Miller starts thinking. This apple of discord gets uh, thrown into the, this the was arena. His, this was his this notebook. This was the development. <laughs> uh, and... Um, it looks more like the Mississippi going three ways <laughs> or which way. This is to be a synthesis. We just, a yes. We just anyway, got lost in the woods, as he said. Well, uh, he never published the book, did he? No, it's still there. No, because but, it, it uh, overexpanded. It, you see, the contradictions of Lawrence and the own paradoxical nature of Miller together made a... <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's rather difficult for them to read, but they might, might want to share... <laughs> you see, uh, we decided to draw a tree and that each branch of the tree would help to organize this marvelous material. And of course the tree grew also and <laughs> grew and grew and grew. Looks like a fugitive stage out of Blake. Yeah. 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 That's not a bad observation, it is. Hmm? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ideas expressed in, in Lawrence and the, the psychoanalytic view 
between that and uh, Shakespeare, except that Shakespeare did it intuitively, whereas there was all this analysis going on after Freud, but they come to the same result, it seems. But, uh, but, surely, but the book is a triumphant vindication of an artist rather than a psychoanalyst. Yes. And I think he's a bit unjust to Freud, but nevertheless, you couldn't have a better illustration of the mother fixation trans... Uh, trans I don't know, I, don't, I object to it, but I don't see it that much, that much extra added to what, what you know... Another no, but what's added to it is a demonstration artistically that such a thing is the duty and is feasible of everyone. But that's been done before. Well, who did it before? Uh, well, in Shakespeare, you, you're, you're talking about 36 plays. Uh, it's easy to say Shakespeare. I could say Goethe, but by the time you get through first part two, it's certainly evident. But in dealing with the lives of these people, obviously there's an enormous struggle, and, and the big tragedies of Shakespeare are resolved in the very calm, um, essentially resolved Classical. final plays. In Lawrence, if we must deal with him, for 36 novels, you will find that the bitter struggle over this mother fixation, which is first determined, which saved also his relationship to Frida, because he wasn't a man enough for Frida until he demonstrated this to himself, uh, ends also on a note of affirmation and calm with the, with the last short stories and the ship, that long poem, The Ship of Death, uh, etc., which is a, a, a very calm mood, I should say. But the trajectory there is of a big struggle resolved. look back at, at particularly pre-Freudian novels, you can always see the ambivalence, but the people who were living it weren't quite aware no. of their own ambivalence. No. I think and so. now, the ambivalence of Hamlet is certainly not as well depicted as the ambivalence that D.H. Lawrence deals with. Um, I, I don't think there's any new ideas at all. Oh, I, I'm afraid well, there is. I have never heard, I had a young woman student, this amazed me because when I was 20 I can understand uh, being awakened to the senses by Lady Chatterley, but I thought this was a, um, a question of generation. And just the other day, a student of mine who is 20 years old uh, expressed the same experience. And I don't think anybody has ever mentioned that about Shakespeare, do you? No, I don't think so. It was very, <laughs> anyway, plays are not the yeah, same, really. It's not the same uh, level. I mean, it's, I think you have to be much this more is much more instinctive. Hmm? To, to get to Shakespeare, you have to be more mature. You, have, you sort of have to fill in the spaces. You have to be more... emotion yourself. But Lawrence puts it wouldn't, for you. I wouldn't put them together, would you? I would never... Well, no, you know, I, I was beating them a little bit with Nietzsche's <laughs> Birth of Tragedy, which is a book I know you love, and the difference between the classical and romantic. Yes. And we've just come from a sort of cathedral of classicism, even though paradoxically it's experimental Ulysses. Mm -hmm. Do you see, where Joyce hardly features in, the, in, the, in this objective construct, you know, mm -hmm. which is another great artistic triumph. But in Lawrence, as with Byron, you can't talk about his books without talking about him. Mm -hmm. because he was so close to them, he was in full close-up the whole time, and he was using them, as he says, we shed our sicknesses in books, we recreate and repeat our emotions in order to become master of them, mm -hmm. which is a therapeutic thing, and also I want the boys and girls in England to be happy and free and not idiots and frumps, uh, which an intention, he was a bit of a zealot too, it's a different kettle of fish. Oh, so yes, he calls hard, himself... Hard to comp I didn't mean to interrupt, but he calls yeah. himself the priest of love. <laughs> That's it, yes, yes. Which is... Uh, uh, please finish what you were saying. Cause I was well, I mean, I was only it. saying that yes. um, we're but trying to compare an Apollonian it. artist to a Dionysiac, and it's very hard to do, in exactly. a sense. They're both at the same level, exactly. but for different reasons. Like comparing a male writer to a female, you know. But the Dionysiac mm. writer wakes the Dionysiac element in us, whereas the yes. Apollonian cannot wake the Dionysian element in us. Mm. And that's what we owe to Lawrence, I think. Yes, I'm firmly in agreement. And I was also trying to suggest that one of the problems uh, which nature is busy solving by increasing our mother fixation instead of uh, reducing it, in other words, increasing our propensity for homosexuality, was in order to cure the population bulge, since we wouldn't do anything about it ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> It happens with all kinds of things. Why shouldn't it happen with us, since well, we won't control it? That's a definite point against that. Come. Uh, okay. Uh, the mother fixation can just as easily lead to uh, promiscuity, uh, heterosexual promiscuity. As a, as a secondary thing, but it is, of course. 
Yes. Of course, but it's a cover-up, you That's know. That's the story of Don Juan. The classical Don Juan is is running away from love and the mother. You know. Mm. I was thinking more if someone were so uh, so uh, involved in the mother that you would be searching for someone comparable and equal to her, and That's couldn't right. find her. Ever. That's right. But doesn't mm. it also lead to a good deal of impotence? Yes, it does. You know, even yeah. if, not always. <laughs> but you, you know the traditional picture of Don Juan is precisely that, isn't it? Uh, why he can't find rest with any particular woman is because he's fighting uh, an irresistible compulsion towards the homosexual side of his character. You understand I'm not talking about actions as such. These, the, most of these tragic things happen at the age of six months and it's idiotic to find yourself 60 with, with your bonnet still full of idiotic infantile fixations. It's humiliating, but it's the case. <laughs> Uh, and Don Juan, you see, it's very hard to find Bon Juan, um, <laughs> who should be the ideal uh, to strive for. And Don Juan, of course, is in full flight, and hence always unhappy, always unsatisfied, uh, though, he, though he has uh, all the girls in the universe. But that, you see, is orthodox, too. I'm not telling you anything original. Uh, Steckel has written a whole book about that. Well, just bringing up the point in relation to mm. population control. Well, but anything that, anything that prevents children, and surely that's one of the factors that, um, that, that promotes, so to speak, voluntary abnegation of having children. I mean, we should encourage it. <laughs> well, well, I don't know. Yeah. Either they stop the population. Well, 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 and a lot of it seems to be because of the, the same number of acts of population, but a lot of them are with the I same... Don't, I don't think the rats have edible complexes or anything like that. No, they that. don't, but it's still... A, well, maybe they do, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still a good population <laughs> control. Well, homosexuality is population control, sure, but uh, the mother complex is population control might not be. I mean, in one year you can fertilize several hundred girls if you're, you know, <laughs> and, then, and then you can be uh, gay the rest of your life and still you... Uh, well, there are, there are societies that do work that way, don't they? They're mostly matriarchal. It may well be we're moving towards a, a matriarchal instead of a paternal and patriarchal family pattern in which the girls rule, because now they've, uh, they've definitely um, escaped the noose. The girls. No, in fact, it's, it's very escaped. it's very hard to talk to. To uh, uh, I was t telling a nice how difficult it is sometimes to describe how dismal our lives were in the kind of society depicted by Lawrence, with those two great terrifying fears: one of syphilis and the other of getting illegitimately pregnant, which absolutely ruined all lovemaking. Yeah. At least in, uh, I, I thought the atmosphere of England was disastrous from that point of view, and I think part of Lawrence's struggle uh, would have been resolved automatically had he been here now talking to you. Do you see? He would say, well, it's not quite the same case, and he'd probably be able to modify some of his, his uh, whip. But uh, you had that problem, too. You say you nearly lost your family because of writing a book about Lawrence. Well, <laughs> and Tropic of Cancer mm -hmm. was uh, when I smuggled copies uh, into <laughs> England to distribute to other writers. I smuggled six or seven copies. I was facing two years in prison, firm. And when Daniel decided to publish Godek's book of the It, a man from Scotland Yard came round and said he'd bring an action against him and he'd risk five years in prison. The publishers wouldn't touch it. They wouldn't print my black book and leave the four-letter words. There were only three. I mean, by modern standards, this is not even a dirty book. It's not even mildly prurient. Uh, but, but this reputable publisher wouldn't, wouldn't take it unless I removed these three shy little words. Uh, it's difficult to describe. But here you have... Well, tell us about the family. Oh, there was nothing. There was just simply this uh, condemnation for writing about Lars. They were ashamed. Because this was a period, you know... But you when come they, from a family of artists. Um, musicians, but... Uh, are they? <laughs> <laughs> who don't read. <laughs> well, anyway, Lars hadn't been translated into French, and my father couldn't read him. And then my mother was Catholic, which made made a difference. But the point was simply that this was the period when they threatened to burn his paintings. You remember when they yes. visited all his friends in England to whom he had sent copies of Lady Chatterley. In other words, the persecution was very real. Oh, he could have... It um, was not, uh, mm. you know, it was not an imaginary persecution. Mm. And then the reviewers said terrible things. Even 
the Bloomsbury group, nobody stood by him at all. Absolutely nobody. Even those who wrote about him afterwards. Except Richard Aldington. Yes. Who never waited for anybody's yes. approval. He stood by him. And... Um, it's hard for you to, to realize that mm. atmosphere, you know, to know. Because you haven't really lived under it. Though you're beginning. Now. But they will, uh, they will obviously create their own neuroses as they go along. Can you predict what they might be? Now, all these girls are pretty soon going to be head of publishing industries, scientists, doctors, What surgeons. I know about young women now is they're trying to say that a man has written uh, erotically, but it's not satisfying to them, and that they have to find their own vision of sensuality and their own way of writing about it. Um, you know, they get together and they find that they're imitating Miller or mm. whoever, but they, they are not writing as women. So that the young women that, uh, that I have known are now getting together trying to find, uh, they have been for so many years, you see, shying off talking about how they feel. And the women who have, there, there is a woman called Jeanne Dubon who sent Henry a book mm -hmm. and said, I am called in France the female Henry Miller. In the first place, that put him off reading her. <laughs> <laughs> And the second place, she was immediately, absolutely immediately stifled by the critics on a moral basis, not on the basis of her writing, which was superb and very comic and great sense of humor and all that. Uh, she was immediately smothered because they were so outraged by a woman writing so openly about her experiences, uh, a real parallel to Miller, which, you know, for many years was also judged on that basis. Why, why is it, that, do you think, that... Whenever I find that most females that read cancer, or any woman for that matter, find it so objectionable after 30 or 40 pages that they... That they have no fall. sense of humor. They have no sense of humor, and they don't realize how you can adapt these things to yourself. I read Miller and decided I will be as free as that. I mean, I made the conversion. I didn't put myself in the, in the victim's place. Do you think that <laughs> you Miller, if, if Miller is, you, can, you can make any analogy to Lawrence in this way? That, that he, of course, he's writing about much different topical things when he's writing about. Uh, Miller was writing in a different vein. He wasn't the priest of love. He was writing comedy of love. But yet he speaks of love. of love so often in so many uh, enigmatic ways, very, very hidden, but oftentimes very real, and very, very forceful. German. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to say what he said to me when I put up this question to him. He said, the mistake they make about me is that my books are not about sex, they're all about self-liberation. And that as I was a child of a Puritan culture, it was the only way I could go to smash the eggshell for myself. Mm -hmm. And they should be regarded, the more grisly the scenes, they should be regarded like one of those Tibetan altars which contain blood-stained masks and all the paraphernalia of the horrid earthy life in order, on behalf of a spiritual life, uh, which is a fair, fair enough defense. And if read with that intention in mind, one, I know there are parts that may put my teeth on edge, in sexes particularly. Um, uh, yes, that I, uh, I agree with you. Uh, he, he certainly, but he, he's uh, doing it with an intention, and uh, I find sex is too caca pee, pee for me. Yes, I agree. Uh, is, you know? is that real, though? though? Is that, is, did that really happen with Mona, that terrible part in that, where, where she kicks him out? Really, just running around in the rain for weeks. In in which? Uh, sexes, when well, I should suppose so. I I, Mo, Mona, Mona, you knew, yeah. of course. I know, but I, I couldn't read mm. sex. You, you don't know about that. I should say there was an element of truth in it, or you know, because he he doesn't actually embroider, but sometimes he time scales things together. And I didn't I didn't know particularly about that, but I'm mean, it's one of the most dramatic things. Yeah, He's a very Dostoevskian masochist, Henry. Yeah and has a good broad streak of Puritanism. Disagree, if you will, <laughs> don't you think? As indeed Lawrence did. I agree. Oh, huh? yes, Lawrence was a Puritan. Lawrence would quarrel with friends who uh, separated and married someone else. Uh, I think it was Aldington, no, who yes. Had, yes. Was, was living with one woman and then married another, and Lawrence yeah. was incensed by mm. that. Mm. He was Puritan. To call himself the priest of love is already... That's a very uh, dangerous. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a quotation I wanted to do. He says that it was... Um, 
It was a nourishment of the mind by the senses that he affected. That's what Gardner said. And Who said that? that? Was very well nourishment said. of the mind. Nourishment of the mind by mm. the senses. Yes. That's mm. what he affected. I think there's a difference between Lawrence and Miller in that sense. And Miller was trying to crack the Puritan. Well, Miller, so, Miller's much more selfish, isn't he? In other words, Miller was only thinking about his own salvation. Out of his own whereas Lawrence <laughs> had a sly eye on the Welsh coal mines and uh, <laughs> the habit of making love of those dreadful um, troglodytes up in the middle of, uh, in the middle of England. Mm -hmm. And there he really did have a case because this sadness, the poverty of, our, of intellect and of ordinary living life, indeed, mm -hmm. in those uh, heavily over-industrialized <laughs> areas where... Uh, where money goes hand in hand with drabness. Uh, here you have enough space, you're just about filling it up now, and it's going to start here, I suppose. <laughs> but in those small towns, those mining towns particularly, his description of that sort of life is uh, truly sad. I think very sad. Do you think, and I, uh, I, I put the case in setting up these things, that the, uh, the fact of achieving an, a work of art on the theme of Sons and Lovers, uh, n not only saved him as an artist uh, about this one principle, the white peacock is also much more agonized about it, but also saved his marriage in a sense because it affirmed his artisthood. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and with Frida at his side, it left him much freer to really love for the first time. Yes. It was the most important, yes. perhaps the most critical and most important part of his career. It was suddenly... Um, realizing himself as an artist. And from then on, there was simply no looking back. Okay. That marvelous relationship. The book, uh, if, to read the book on Frida that came out recently is mm -hmm. very interesting because it shows the collaboration that took place. In other words, there were fecund battles. Yes. There were mm -hmm. fertile battles. There was always something good that came out of it. He learned something, she learned something. You know, there was an exchange. It was the way they had to exchange, but that they did. And her knowledge of psychology was very strong. Well, well she, she says she had a Freudian, an Austrian, mm -hmm. um, a young Austrian doctor who was an ardent Freudian and trained by Freud, uh, who transformed her life just about just before she met Lawrence. Mm -hmm. She was then Frieda Weekly. She was the wife of an, a Don in, uh, yes. in something. Yes. But she says that she, uh, she taught uh, a bit of, of Freud to Lawrence. But frankly, in this psychoanalysis in the unconscious, it's not that at all, is it? No, no, he's really uh, hostile to it. Mm, mm. <laughs> it's as if he didn't want to delve consciously into what was happening in him. He liked to do it in his own uh, happening way in the books, which yes. was semi-conscious. It was not a conscious thing. Where's, you know, I don't think he knew. Yes. Well, at least he could t take you into the, the conflict, but it wasn't... Um, Yes, it wasn't controlled by an outside theory. It was his own control. Yes. Where he wanted, you know? Yes. Do, do you feel that, um, that uh, a man like Locke, maybe writers in general, are trying to, are denying a reality where they don't fit, creating a ra reality where they just barely fit, and then trying to change the reality by their creation, by publishing? No, I don't. No, I wouldn't put it that way. I think they deny the reality that they don't that they don't like, you know, which which Lawrence was <laughs> was given as a child. Then they seek another reality, which actually then uh, he finds people that fit into it, and then are attracted by the work, and then therefore that makes another reality. The people who read Lawrence, loved Lawrence, understood mm -hmm. Lawrence made another reality. We had a, a way of looking at the world and experience. So when the artist turns his back on the reality he doesn't like and says, I am making another world, uh, he does really make another world in which you or I or whoever finds himself in Lawrence, mm -hmm. as I did when I was 20, mm -hmm. um, he does create a reality in which you can live. Surely. Mm -hmm. And in which you can progress. Well, hinting at escapism. <laughs> but it's really li like a plant looking for, uh, putting down a taproot and looking yes. for a fertile soil. Exactly. Because he feels life is so damn short that if I don't find somewhere realizing myself, it, it, I'm going, everything's going to waste. My whole life will be wasted by a sort of mere inattention. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the industrialists and women in love where here is the incarnation of strength and power. They call everything about it, uh, sort of a peak of strength. 
And his only resolution was to go to sleep in the snow. Yes, he was weak. Mm -hmm. He had no interior uh, substance. See, he had, I think he wanted to prove that he had no inner strength to withstand catastrophe. Mm, I think so. Because, Sorry? Where did Lawrence identify himself? So? He must have known that kind of person, I think, don't you think, in his mining background? Uh, he must do you know, there, there, there is a model for almost all the Lawrence yes. characters, and I've forgotten. <laughs> but I was so amazed to find that at that period they were doing nothing but putting each other in each other's yes. books. And, um, <laughs> in all the conversations yes. with Aldington, you couldn't discuss one of these things without them saying, yes, and wasn't Bertie angry? That was yes. Bertrand Russell. <laughs> uh, and yes. so on. And yet there never seems to have been a libel suit of any sort. No. I've forgotten who. No. If Aldington were here, he could tell you straight off that it was a Alec War or something like that. You know, you would find Lawrence in uh, Huxley as Rampion. Yes, remember? of course, in Point then, Counterpoint. Uh, then Moore... Not more. Uh, Murray would write about uh, Middleton Murray. Yes, yes, yes then, that awful and man. And then yeah. Lawrence would write about Murray in a way that infuriated him. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> we were going to end on point counterpoint. In all hours, we've just come down from the great pyramid of Joyce for this Lawrence session. I'm afraid it's not going to be time, but I'd selected point counterpoint because Huxley led, it seemed to me, as, as not only as a friend of Lawrence, but as a mind on his own, in his own right, into modern man, so to speak, particularly his renunciation of, of scientific materialism per se and his espousal of Eastern religion in Vedanta and the philosophy of, of Mahayana Buddhism and so on. He's very much our contemporary. But unfortunately, I, I miscalculated, and I don't think we'll be able to do that but I felt that would make a, a, a shape of some sort, because after Huxley, we haven't really made any theoretical advances in any direction whatsoever, have we? Or have you, have you thought of that? I mean, Huxley's so contemporary. I have thought about that. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone... You mean beyond um, the I'm, Huxley I'm just attitude? thinking as a, as a, cultural, as a mm -hmm. cultural sort of uh, marker, not Huxley as himself, but... No. His, his span of thought, so to speak, is tremendously contemporary. Does anyone feel that, that for example, we've got beyond uh, the Huxley position in any way? I think you do, but I, I can't make out... Um... <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> and, then, and nowadays, um, since 1960, you said black literature is really the most important thing. Who? First of all, the beat. Black the oh, the Kerouac, the Kerouac thing. Kerouac. Yes. I think they're still very formative. I don't think they've surpassed in, in scope, do you think? I mean in their, co in their, in their, their comprehension of all the various issues and their attempt, so to speak, to make a synthetic view of a universe which is telling. I think individual writers have made wonderful strikes in all directions, but sort of comprehensive <laughs> thinking. I don't think Huxley was a great artist, but he was a great coordinator. Uh, and, and, uh, well, I'm so grateful. I first heard of, of Suzuki's essays uh, about 40 years ago, thanks to a curious little essay of Huxley's. I first heard of Lao Tse when I was trying to write a paper on Oscar Wilde. When he was head of a fashion magazine to make a bit of dough, he reviewed books, and he revealed the first translation of, of uh, Lao Tse. Uh, it's in this way that coordinators are helpful. I'm very grateful. He saved me years. Well, now, please, but could you develop a little bit? Just the idea, the idea that you think of Western literature in terms of coordinating all these things and you're doing a, a, a full philosophy of life in, in a book, which I don't see at all being so. Um, just look at, at, at even some of the uh, non-standard earlier great Goethe, uh, well, Germans in particular, seems Kafka, um, different people who haven't really presented that much, but, but use tremendously novel ideas. Well, if you had to write something on, on Kerouac's philosophy of life, I suppose you could make something well, of it. He, he deals a whole lot with the infantile, what you've been talking about, but he doesn't go into uh, but he, there's no question of resolution for him. Resolution is taking to the road. No, res no resolution. Which is also the tramp's solution. Why not? But okay, it is... Resolution uh, is, is mystical. It's called perambulatory paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all right. It's quite valid. What, what, just presenting a completely different aspect, what about 
for example, the New York poets now. I think people like Ashbury and O'Hara are presenting not necessarily, uh, as you say, fusion, uh, a fusion of a total philosophy, but Ashbury, I feel, mm -hmm. presents one or two ideas in a poem, in, say, a one-page poem. And I think that he, his imagery and his, his, what, his uh, language is so dramatic and new in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. For instance, Ashbury, he's, I think he's my favorite poet these days. I think he's doing wonderful things in O'Hara. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. O'Hara I know better than him. But I, th I think the poet is under an obligation to take that bigger view, don't you? A novelist can use his novel as a sort of illustration and, and he's got more scope to do it, but a poet's almost in honor bound got to produce something that stands up for the whole universe, really, and well, to the whole universe. For instance, Phineas Blake advances in, in, in writing with using humor are, are pretty you know, vast these days. A lot of people are working on Things which started a long time ago, but um, there's a lot of new ideas, the, the sort of surreal kind of humor in, in a lot of modern poetry. But those are definite things that have gone by since the 1930s. But you know, the degree of ignorance is so enormous today because most of these things were done by the Dadaists in about 19. Uh, mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. uh, there was practically nothing that the lettrist and the Dadaist and so on and so on haven't done 20 years ago. And the experiments with language, breaking it up and pulling it apart, which finally resulted in an attempt to artistically justify the performance in Finnegan, which you find is a great success and I find wearying. But, I mean, I love the idea. Wearying? I, 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 no, I agree that the most of that, most of what you, you see is, is mm -hmm. about, uh, good, but there's a lot of stuff in the background and so on. Well, Harry Levin's essay is more interesting than the book, you see, because it's a brilliant analysis of the intentions, and he illustrates with the best jokes which occur between page 200 and 900. I'm sorry, uh, about Finnegan. Finnegan, yes. I love Harry Levin's essay. I heard Harry Levin. Levin, he's Yale. He, he's, a, he's a Yale scholar who's absolutely marvelous. He's so thrilling that um, you keep going back to Finnegan to verify his quotations, but Finnegan itself would have defeated me had I not had a, a Levin to check with. Well, Joe Campbell. Joe, you know Joe Campbell, Skeleton Key. Uh, yes, yes, I haven't read that one, actually. Mm. And I, how's your Finnegan? <laughs> <laughs> I was never able to read all school. No, I was wondering, I confess that. I've been, I, I been badly mauled for that. Le Le Levy, was it? Yes. Uh, and what a good book, huh? Yes, but it and was an intellectual exercise for me. I never was touched by it. Mm. Well, uh, it's just a... Hmm? It's certainly the greatest thing that's happened since... Well, that's certainly a matter of opinion, but I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> unless you have a, a feeling of identity with what's going on, I certainly didn't. Uh, it's very difficult to, to gather anything out of it at all. Because I, I really do believe that Joyce, what he wrote, was writing for himself and didn't give a good goddamn about anyone else. <laughs> yes. Yes, he certainly didn't want to uh, change the world, did he? He wanted to change himself, I suppose. He wanted to uproot his Catholic rigidity a bit, I think, and Molly Bloom did the job for him. But it's a different kettle of Joyce, really, isn't it? And I think most of these experimental things depend on the temperament, and if there are good poets coming up, and they'll always be coming up, so much the better. But in terms of technical innovation, I don't feel really philosophically we've got beyond, uh, beyond that little area demarcated here, here in, in your part of the world by people like Gerald Hurd, Aldous Huxley, uh, and vaguely the books that came out of that period, the Zen books, the... Uh, after all, Kerouac was at, uh, at the nipple with Alan Watts, so to speak. I mean, his Zen was uh, taken entirely from Alan Watts's popularizations, which were themselves popularizations of Suzuki, uh, which Huxley had taught us to read 100 years ago. So that all that is very relevant to everything we've been discussing now. And I was just wondering at what point of advance, whether perhaps you'd, you'd suddenly discover something I didn't know, like a big, big breakthrough of some sort, Cybernetics, because um, these things do. The old forms. I mean, the, mm -hmm. uh, John Barth has been an advocate of the literature of exhaustion, that we've exhausted forms now, and the novel, if not dead, is certainly exhausting most of the forms that it's ever had. 
And so he's responded by going back to incredibly ancient forms. And he's, mm -hmm. he's simply uh, rewriting Homer in, in strictly Homeric terms. Mm -hmm. Except that, uh, as Ms. Nain has written a book on the model of the future, the, 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 there's still possibilities for the novel uh, beyond exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> what is your novel of the future? And I forgive me, I haven't read it. Uh, well, there I spoke of how the novel would have to survive by going back to uh, the biography and autobiography and the diaries. In other words, it had lost its footing mm -hmm. and didn't have any life. And You know, remember D.H. Lawrence having that wonderful saying, uh, how are we going to transpose a living experience without its withering on the way? And my answer was that it had to be... Uh, registered immediately while it was alive and while it was warm or else we had to have the capacity of the artist to recreate that life in it even after a time. So I feel that there has been a return to nourishment, the nourishment of the novel, which was a dying of, of unreality really and of distance uh, to getting back closer to the human being through the biography, the autobiography, the diaries, and so forth, which I think is a trend now, mm -hmm. in order to get in touch with the self again and then take the material for fiction. But that the, the, the fiction would be rooted in something more human and, and uh, not what we call the realist, which so, is just recording, you know, like the a, journey. A, a so to me, that. there is a, a, f a new fusion being made say, between fiction and, and the life um, annotations, mm -hmm. uh, nourishment. Then the novel of the future is the novel of the present, because that's being done for the last 10 or 15 years. Yes, there has been... Norman Mailer wrote his uh, no. novel as a history when he talked yeah. about March on the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And it was a novel, at the same time it was history. So as Anita now is writing novels, that are accurate, accurate descriptions of what exactly mm -hmm. went on mm -hmm. in Russia. I, I just was looking at this, this Emerson quote that I assume Miller put right before the beginning of Cancer. These novels will give way by and by to diaries and autobiographies, captivating books, if only a man knew how to choose among what he calls his experiences and how to record truth truly. Yeah. Yes, because some diaries are very dull and some biographies are impossible. Uh, you know, you, you get nothing from the person at all. Did any of you read the life of Paul Bowles, who has had an exotic and interesting life, and his biography tells you nothing? He's a good yes, writer, though. Know? Yes, he's a good writer when mm -hmm. he's writing a story. When he was writing his biography, he tells you nothing, conveys mm -hmm. nothing. Do you see the novel of the future as being limited to um, a historical... Robinson Crusoe type no, no, more no, no. Effusive, uh, I see it as a new fusion, you know, more that like, um, effusive like uh, uh, Tom Jones. And no, the inner, life. More, more the inner life. It's the inner and the outer better balanced. Uh, you see, we've had the interior. I mean, the Joycean interior journey but purely interior and purely intellectual. And then I think we had to make a fusion between the human experience and not the, in the realistic terms, because I don't, you know, I don't think that that's reality, but in the sense of inner reality fused with the outer reality. And that is happening, I think, is what we call the new consciousness, a new, a new um, mixture of elements that are based on really on journals and biography. There has been an extraordinary return to biography mm, because yes, it's found more interesting than novels. <laughs> of course. But I have a theory. Would you confirm or deny that the novel was destroyed by uh, Freudian case histories because nothing is more fascinating than to read Little Hands. <laughs> it's much better than any novels. Um, and it also shares the element that you were describing, namely being true to life in the sense that it's a true accounting of a, something that happened. And I think the four big Freudian uh, things were really, uh, for example, the analysis of Hamlet. It's not possible to rewrite Hamlet now. No. He's only got to say, Mum, and you know where you are. <laughs> and it's thanks to Freud that you do. And the long uh, dis the decortication of the Hamlet myth uh, from Freud is marvelous. It stopped us going that way. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and then little hands showed what could be done with the neurosis at the age of a, with, with a kid you couldn't analyze, and triumphant too, analyzed by accident through his dreams and through his phobias, like his parents. Uh, it's the most brilliant short story. Uh, and two others, Dora and so on, I suggest that issued as novels in paperback, they should be with prefaces by novelists because we can't do as well as that even today. <laughs> but it proves your point about the prefaces inner... Prefaces by analysis. What? Prefaces by analysis. No, that spoils everything. No. <laughs> I, I shouldn't have said that because I'm sitting next to an analyst. But <laughs> no, the only uh, wonderful, vital use of analysis is that it helps us to move to the next step so that we can grow. I mean, analysis m makes us move. You see, once we have liquidated the uh, Oedipus complex, let's say, I was speaking the other day of the ten si different cycles in my life, how analysis would come in so that I would terminate the relationship with the father so that I wouldn't go all my life looking for a father, and you know, which some yes. writers do. Mm -hmm. uh, that had to end. And then there was another cycle with the mother, and that had to end, too, mm -hmm. because then I was started to be the mother. Then that, you go into another cycle, and that's the value of synthesis, is that it makes you move into another cycle. You're finished with that. It's clear, you know, it's really that's right, it's resolved. Mm. And that is the fecund part of analysis. Right. Now, the, the sterile part is that we analyze instead of, uh, of living. And, <laughs> I mean, that's another thing. But everything can be misused. So some people have misused analysis. I've used it to move into another cycle. I don't want the same experience repeated over and over. And many writers have remained... Yes, stuck. Stuck, haven't mm, they? Mm, mm, mm. Can I uh, say something about the... Uh, there's a lot of discussion about there's no such thing as a new type of novel. That's what I thought I was hearing. And the, uh, one thing that was popping up in my mind was the Snow White by Don uh, Barthelme. And, uh, I didn't read that. Just the, uh, the thing that I particularly liked about it is that it seemed to be just a series of little one act vignettes and all. And if you shuffle them, which your memory will do it you know, a couple of years after you read the book, it'll change. And then later on in life, new things will be more important. The memory will reach back and shuffle them again. And I'm wondering if uh, you know, when people say the novel's dead, well, there's something that seems. Oh, well, the people who say the novel's dead are. Uh, are dead writers. <laughs> I think it's always said before the new, the new writer pops said. up, really. It's always said, you know. I, mean, I think uh, it's always Larry said, and, and then a, bang, just suddenly yeah. um, something, something new comes out. Larry discovered a new way of telling a story. That's, a, that's out of bounds. <laughs> is it out of bounds? <laughs> My I neighbor. I think, mes enfants, that the time is up. And some of you had other classes and perhaps more profound ones, but surely not more enjoyable. And so let me thank Anais for coming along today and sitting in. And I'm very sorry Henry couldn't come, but he'll have a full record of our deliberations played on his bedroom wall tonight. So he'll be pleased. And if he has some arguments, I'll bring them when I come on Monday.